Well, welcome to New Life. My name is Michael and I'm one of the pastors here. And it's my privilege to be able to continue our series on essential faith. Would you join with me as we pray? Father, I believe right now that you want to speak to us through your word. And that no matter how or where your word is preached faithfully, I believe it doesn't return void. So God, fill me with a fire to preach passionately the truths in Scripture, but help me get out of the way that your Holy Spirit might be heard. And Jesus, for all those who are first time in church today, Spirit, I pray you would soften their hearts that they might hear your voice. Less of me, more of you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was growing up, I remember one moment when I was 12, when I had the good fortune to travel with my dad to a, to a different country of a different culture and a different background. I'd grown up in a Judeo-Christian society uh, where the dominant faith of our culture was a monotheistic faith, a one God faith. When we went to this other country, we stepped into a country whose culture had diverse faiths, but its main prominent faith was one of various gods and various temples. And I can remember driving around this country with my father on a missions trip and, and, and seeing that on every corner there was a new temple. There was a new God that was worshipped in different regions for different purposes. In most hotel rooms and, and houses we went into, there were shrines to different gods of different understandings, but all under the umbrella of one religion. And as I, would, I was seeing these idols, I was seeing these statues, I remember not culturally being able to process it. It's just a young 12-year-old boy and thinking, wow, we don't have idols like this back home. We don't have these statues or these things that we worship on every corner. This isn't present in the culture I'm from. The idea of idolatry was foreign to me. But as I look back, be a little older now, and I didn't realize this at the time, but when I landed back in Australia, I wandered through an airport where every different room had a different shrine or billboard to a different God of our culture, a different idol, a different aspirational promise that if I bought that, was like this, looked a certain way, I would achieve X, Y, and Z. And then I didn't realise as a 12-year-old Michael, but as I hopped in the car and drove home, I remember thinking, wow, they spend a lot of money on those temples. But then we would stop by a building that was billions of dollars. And its whole point was to remind me that I had needs I wasn't aware could be fulfilled by shopping in certain locations. And as I now re reflect, not only at, those, at that stark juxtaposition, but also at my own life in Western culture, I've come to realise that idolatry and idols and the idea of worshipping different things is not something of a different culture or something from ancient history. But I want to suggest today it's a pervasive issue that idols is not an overseas phenomenon, but something that resides deep within Western culture our churches, and may I suggest our hearts. One of the biggest issues, I believe, in, in our corporate and personal relationships with God is our inability to place effective frameworks and thinking around the destructive nature of idolatry. That in the life of Christianity today, this is also the root cause of why so many non-Christians don't understand what it means to follow Christ because so many Christians seem to make it look exactly like the culture around them. And when we don't see the pervasive presence of idolatry in our culture, our church, in our hearts, I think we struggle to understand why there are barriers in our relationship to following Jesus. You know, we're in this series called Essential Faith. And it comes from the idea that, that you know, when, when the world started, when, when Queensland started to reopen again, uh, after being in COVID lockdown, we talked about what was essential to our world. And no one that wasn't a Christian said, the church. It, it seemed like no one was longing or begging for Christians to regather again. It seemed like our faith had become anything but essential. And we want to ask the question, what does it look like for us to have an essential faith to a world in need of a better story? 
And maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. And you're like, I don't know about this Christianity thing. And, and what we want to do today is not say, hey, look at how we live. But we want to help you look at Jesus and the, the man who is more than a man, who is God and how He lived and how He offers hope, restoration and life. But maybe you're a Christian today and I'm talking about idolatry and you're going, hey, whoa, 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 Michael. You're saying I have idolatry in my heart, in my life? Back it up there, buddy. I don't think that's true. And I think, I think we can rise up in defense or recognize that I actually believe Scripture suggests that idolatry is one of the core characteristics of the human problem. Tyson, in his book, The Beautiful Resistance, which is a book that we're using at the moment to kind of guide and use as a resource throughout this series, writes this, We live in a society without a reference point for idolatry. We have neither the cultural framework nor the worldview to support it. And this makes us all the more susceptible to it. Bruce Ellison Benson, a former professor of philosophy, says this, not only are we capable of creating idols and worshipping them, we are likewise capable of being almost completely blind to their existence. Our recognition of idols is often selective. Our recognition of idols is often selective. What's he saying here? We so often are able to go, well, that culture, that country, that person has idols that they worship in their lives, but we are blind to the things in our worlds that may have become idolatrous. And that might seem like a big term. And I want you to stay with me today because I believe that not only is there a truth here for us, but there is a way to life and life in all of its fullness. So I want to talk today about, you know, real quick, what is idolatry? Why do we have idols in our life? Why is there a need for us to have idols, things that we worship other than God? Why does God care about idolatry? But also, how do we solve the human problem? How do we solve the issue that so many of us find hope, life, meaning and worth in things other than God. And to do this, I want us to go into a text, which let me just warn you, it's, it's a bit complex. So take a deep breath with me. And trust me, it's going to be good. God is going to speak to us. And I believe you'll be benefited and blessed today. But it comes from Romans chapter 1, verse 18. And Romans chapter 1, verse 18 is written by a man named Paul to a church in Rome, to Christians in Rome. And the whole of Romans is a beautiful exposition of the gospel, a beautiful explanation of what the gospel is about. And he starts the book of Romans in Romans chapter 1, explaining why we need the gospel. He answers the big age old problem, what's wrong with the world? And so he launches into an explanation. He starts in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. He says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, let me stop, because I said a word there that I know is uncomfortable. I said wrath. Now, when we hear the word wrath, our culture tells us we don't want to believe in a God of wrath and anger. And maybe you're a Christian here and you're like, whoa, Michael, Michael, I don't want to talk about wrath, you know, ixnay on the wrath a kind of stuff. I bought a friend and it's a bit weird. Maybe you're here and you're a non-Christian and, and you, you don't want to hear about fire and brimstone. That's not why you tuned in or came to church today. But I think our hesitation around that word wrath has, has because we, we misunderstand it. And what Paul is writing about here is God's reaction to the state of the world. That there is something that grieves and angers the heart of God. But I just, I want us to take that, the, the wrath, and I want us to shelve it for a second. I'm going to come back to it, but I want to explain why it's important and why we can't run from it when we're talking about God, when we talk about Jesus, why it's actually, I want to debate, central to understanding the need for the cross. So Paul goes on and he says this, For what can be known about God is plain to them, to us, to all of humanity, because God has shown it to us, to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Now, what's Paul writing about here? He, he says something really obvious. The Christian faith predominantly serves, believes in and worships a God that we cannot see. 
But he suggests that this God that we believe is real, believe loves you, believes is for you, has a hope and a plan for your life. Even though he may be invisible, he's left breadcrumbs in creation. He's left fingerprints everywhere to point towards his existence. In fact, Paul is saying here that when you look at creation, its intention and purpose isn't just to bless us, but it's also to point towards His existence. The God of invisible attributes left traces and evidence for His existence in the world around us. This is when we see a sunset and our hearts well up and rejoice in its beauty. We, we know that it points towards a divine painter. It means that when we know that at the age at birth, the miracle of creation and new life, we go, this is amazing, possibly couldn't have happened by chance. And we know there's a God of intention, of fine tuning. Then when we look at science and we see that science proves that this world is infinitely complex, but finely tuned for existence, we go, surely there must be a master designer because creation's purpose is to show man what is always, I believe, known, that there is an initial causa behind the causation of all things. This is a beautiful truth, friends. G.K. Chesterton once said, the greatest sorrow for the atheist is to have rise up in joyful gratitude at the nature of existence and have no one to thank. Paul suggests that God created the world, not just to bless us, not for it just to be enjoyed by us, but to point back to his existence. So what went wrong? Well, what's the issue? Well, Paul steps into this. Paul explains. Paul moves forward. Romans 1 starts at the beginning of, of talking about God's proof of his own existence in the world around us, written to the heart of all man, but then something went wrong. And you know, if, if anyone who's observed anything in the world knows that the world is not in a good place, so what is it? What's corrupted the nature and beauty of existence? Uh, a little bit down, verse 21, it says, For although they knew God, so although they could see God in the creation around them, they did not honour Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and foolish in their hearts. Their hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Paul writes here and goes, for even though they could, could see the proof, even though they knew in their hearts God's existence, they, changed the, they exchanged the worship of the Creator. They exchanged the, the idea of the sunset being beautiful because of an initial supreme loving being and exchanged it to worship things of their own creation. They exchanged worship of the Creator for the created. And we placed our effort, our weight, and our hope for success and survival on the created things which were never strong enough to hold that up. Now, now we can dismiss this uh, you know, something as, as idolatry, as something that's only seen through statues and temples of cultures we may not understand or be a part of, but it's not true. That, that what Paul seeks to highlight here is that the innate disposition of the male-female humanity's heart is that we are idol-making factories that for some reason we put our hope and our worship on things that were created. And what we do is when God doesn't meet our needs, we then look to the things that God created to fulfill the needs we think God should have met. A guy named David Foster Wallace says like this, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as, worship, as, as not worshipping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what we worship. And David, he goes on to say this, therefore the opposite of believing in God is an atheism. It's actually believing in other things placing our trust, our hope in other things. And this is the root of idolatry. This is the root of all that is antithetical. And here's the problem, friends. The God we serve, Jesus Christ, doesn't play second fiddle in the ranks of priorities to the things He's created. He doesn't take second priority because he thinks, well, if you want to serve something else above me, that's okay. Because we are placing the things that he created for us above the one that created them in the first place. It's a disordering of loves and of what's right and what's good. Timothy Keller explains idolatry in a beautiful way. He says, we think that idols are bad things. They're not. Idols in themselves are not wrong. And it's almost never the case. The greater the good, the more likely we are to expect that it can satisfy our deepest need and hopes. Anything can serve as a counterfeit God or an idol, especially the very best things in life. 
So what is an idol? An idol is anything more important to you than God. We see the blessings of God and we take them and make them ultimate things when they were never meant to be the ultimate things, but the indicator of the ultimate one, Jesus, His existence and His nature. And we fail. And the reason why is because we end up trusting in the things of God more than in God Himself. And what happens is we take creations. We take relationships, our boyfriends, our girlfriends. We place our hope in them. We place a hope in that marriage that we think will solve all of our issues of insecurity. We, we make an ultimate longing for a bank account or a job. We, we, we put our hope in our children's success and performance. Right? The singles in the world think if they can just get a relationship, then they will feel happy and worthwhile. They'll have fulfillment. That car, that job, that hobby, that next thing. And what, what happens when we, when we idolize it is we take all of our innate, and I want to suggest eternal desires, and we place them onto temporary, finite things. And the problem with this is, is that things that were created by God were never meant to carry the weight of the eternal desires in your life that can only be fulfilled by God. When we place our hope and our worth and our value into a relationship, thinking if I can just get a boyfriend, a girlfriend, if I can get married, if I can get a job, if I can be successful, if I can have this money in my bank account, we heap the weight of eternal desires upon something that is fallible, finite, and feeble in nature. And we're shocked when it crumbles. When, when parents, we place our hopes on our children, they don't perform the way we want them to, and we think that it's a reflection of our worth when that relationship doesn't turn out the way you want it to and everything starts to unravel, when our bank account, our job, we lose, things shift and change and we, everything unravels. Why? It's because we've placed the hope and value that we should only have ever placed in and on God upon something that was never created to sustain you, to fulfill you or to give you the hope that only God can. And, and, and you see this, that when a relationship where someone believes it's the end point and some of their whole existence crumbles. What they do is not identify the problem was their hope in that relationship was too strong for the relationship to withstand it. They just take their worship of that idol and they place it on the next functional idol they think will happen. And so they join a gym thinking if they can just get fit enough, if they improve their life, then, then the whole left by the, by the fallible idol they were worshiping can be fulfilled, can be sustained, can be replaced. And we have to question, are the things in our life that our heart is truly meditating on, longing for, and thinking if I could just have blank, then I would be X, Y, Z. I would, I would be successful, I have worthwhile. Is it actually able, strong enough, and has it proven throughout society and history to sustain and be able to give what only God can give? It's interesting how branding and marketing has changed. You know, 50, 60 years ago, they would sell dishwashers or rings or shoes or clothes based on their functionality. If you buy this shoe, you'll be comfortable when you run. If you buy this dishwasher, you'll be able to wash this many dishes. Now branding has changed to not be about what the product does, but what the product will make you. When you watch a Nike ad, it no longer really shows people um, exhibiting the shoe or the product. It shows a lifestyle, it shows success. It shows people achieving this, this sense of, um, winning. And so if you buy Nike, you start to think, if I get Nike, then I will have success and winning. It doesn't matter what I wear of Nike, just as long as I'm wearing Nike. And so brands and marketing have started to appeal to the innate desires and existential longings of our heart that can only be fulfilled by Jesus. Friends, are what you're pursuing actually making you someone that you were created to be? Or have we placed desire have we loved and longed for things which are good, but were never meant to take an ultimate position in our life? This is why Paul writes, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against 
all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unforgiveness suppress the truth. And again, at the end, he goes into the same verse um, and he builds on it and he says in verse 24, therefore God gave them up in their lusts to the heart and impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. So what happens? The Bible tells us in Romans chapter one, God created all things to not only be a blessing to creation, but to point back to his existence and the loving selfless God who longed to have communion and relationship with you. But then man decided in our fallenness that we wanted to be in control and so we took the things of God and made them ultimate gods in God's place and wondering why the world is dysfunctional around us and then how does God respond in that for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven so you can't understand God's wrath unless you understand the why behind it Why does the Bible talk of God rising in anger? Why does God talk about God giving us up? See, this wrath is not this sense of retributive punishment. We think sometimes when we hear about God's wrath, there's this sense of going, it isn't fair that God is angry. I don't like the God of wrath. I don't like the God of anger. I want a God that's like super buddy God, the warm and cuddly and, and safe. But that is not a God of love. Because to understand the depth of God's love, you have to understand the depth of God's wrath. Let me explain. If God created the world, if God created you, if God created everything to actually thrive and grow and have its worth and and its identity given to it by its worship and, and its place as a child, as a son and daughter of God, and then He looks down and He sees His children chasing after things as ultimate things and and their worship of money, their worship of sex, their worship of family, their worship of relationships is actually hurting them and is actually breaking the very creation He made to be good and perfect. What kind of a God, what kind of a Father, what kind of a, a, a being that is worthy of our praise would He be if He didn't rise up and go, this isn't the way it should be. See, so often what we do with God is this. We, we have a different expectation of God than we have of ourselves. When someone commits an injustice towards you or you see something wrong, like a social injustice or something on the news that shouldn't have happened, when you hear a politician do something corrupt or when something in your family or someone in your family is mistreated, what happens in your heart? So often we respond in what? Anger, this righteous anger where we go, this is not the way it should be. And even a simple song cuts us off in traffic. We're like, how dare you? Why? Because there's this sense in us that goes, that's not the way that everything should run. It should be better than this. And we turn to God and God says, I'm angry at the brokenness in our world. We go, hey God, I get to be angry. You don't. Hang on, hang on a second. If God wasn't angry at the fact that He sees His children and the very individuals He loves being broken by decisions that He never wanted them to make, then would He really love us in the first place? I remember my mum once got angry at me. Not once, many times. But one specific moment when I was young, I was about 13 years old, had a birthday party and I invited a whole bunch of mates over my house. And about 3 a.m. in the morning, my friends and I decided to go for a walk around the neighbourhood. And uh, and we went for like two hours and we just had fun, you know, for about 5Ks or whatever. And I came back and there's my mum sitting at the kitchen table stricken with grief. And you know that moment when you know you're about to get in trouble with your parents? I'm like, hey, mom. She's like, how dare you? I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, where were you? I'm like, we just went for a walk. I'm like, she said, Michael, you're 13. That's so dangerous. I'm like, mom, why are you angry? She's like, because I care for you. Because I'm responsible for you. Because it wasn't wise. And I'm worried that something will go wrong. And in that moment, if my mum had woken up and be like, oh, you went for a two hour walk at 3 a.m. as you know, a young teenager, whatever, I don't really care. Wouldn't that have shown carelessness? Wouldn't that have shown a lack of investment? Wouldn't that have shown she didn't really love? Friends, our parents' anger isn't always a good description, but I say this because the depth of my mum's frustration in that moment shows me the depth of her love for me. If we are breaking the world around us, we're breaking ourselves by worshipping things that God never intended us to and God didn't care, would we think He even loves us? The word wrath is not something that we should be like, oh, uncomfortable with, but thankful that God cares enough to not be okay when we make decisions that hurt us and hurt others. What a great God we serve that He would love us so much. 
Why is God so angry when He sees us worshipping things that, that He created? Because idols do three things. They bring distortion into our world. We chase idols and they convince us to be made in the image of things in this world that are not good images of who God created us to be. We follow Pinterest accounts and Instagram accounts and, and branding and advertisement. We become someone God never called us to be. These idols, they deceive us to believe that we are something and have an identity less than a son or a daughter of God. But these idols destroy the world around us. The idol of money, no matter how much you get it, you always want more. And, and the idol of money ends up destroying everything when we recognise, as we did back in 2008 in the global financial crisis, what happens when the idols of our world fail us? They destroy everything in their process. So friends, what in your life is more important to you than God? What in your world are you worshipping? Are you following? Are you pursuing more than you pursue Jesus? And if you're a non-Christian here, what are you things, what are the things in your world that your fingers crossed that once you get them, you will have achieved worth and value? And are they strong enough to bear the weight of your hopes, your dreams, but also your eternal desires? So how do we counteract? How do we, how do we respond what do we do when we recognize our hearts are idol-making factories, always distracted, always actually seeking things other than God? We know John Tyson in his book says this beautiful thing. He says, the way you counteract idolatry, the way you counteract a world which calls our attention to other things is to recognize that our worship must resist idolatry. Let me say it again. Our worship must resist idolatry. The choices you make around the personal commitments to personal worship and corporate worship remind you of the story that you must be living. Because what happens when we gather together and we sing the words of God? What happens when you open the Bible and you read the story of God? What happens when we spend time, not just once a week, but daily listening to truths of God's reckless love? Or when we sing songs like, I praise the name, or we read scriptures like John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will have life, and life eternal. What happens when we hear these truths? What happens is, is if we let them, we hold up the God who exists against the gods of our culture and we actually weigh do the idols that the world calls us to worship. Have they done, sacrificed and given us as much as Jesus? And when we start to reflect daily on the message of the cross and the gospel, we see what the wrath of God looks like carried out. That God's intention throughout the whole Old Testament was to say to the Israelites and the people of the world, don't do this and they would do it. Don't do this and they would do it. So He gave them over to their desires and said, see how pursuing the idols of your life, see where that will lead you. But He didn't leave the story there. Once they saw the futility of the idols of their culture, what happened. He rocked up. He stepped down off the throne. He came in the form of Jesus Christ. And he did what no other idol has ever done. He looked at our mistakes. He looked at the consequences of our idolatry. And what did he say? He said, I will take it upon myself. The wrath, the anger, but also the consequences of our sin. I will absorb onto myself on the cross of Calvary. You see, when you look at the cross of Calvary, you see the depth of God's wrath, but you also see the depth of God's love. But he cares enough around the broken state of this world to absorb its consequence of death upon himself. But he cares enough about you to say which boyfriend, which girlfriend, which bank account, which job, which family member ever laid down their lives when you rejected them, gave up everything to pursue you and say, if you come to me and repent for your sins, I will give you life and life in all of its fullness. I'll give you what nothing else in this world can. I will will give you a promise and a future, a clean slate and an eternity where your hopes will never be disappointed. Your worth will never be questioned and your identity will be firmly written in the book of life. 
And when we come together and we worship, our worship resists our idolatry because we remind ourselves that nothing will ever hold up to the sacrifice and gift of the love and grace of Jesus Christ on the cross. Friends, this is why worship on a weekly basis, on a daily basis is so important because it resists idolatry because it reminds our heart not what we feel like, but what we need. Not what we feel like, but what we need. And I just want to encourage you right now. What in your life is more important to you than God? What in your world, if you, if you are yet to believe in, in Jesus, have you placed all of your hope and, and pressure upon? And I want to suggest this, that God calls you to look at creation, to look at the word of God and say, I have left fingerprints and crumbs for you to follow so that you know that that failed job, failed relationship, failed family, whatever the thing that you put all your weight on and it couldn't hold up, it will never measure, measure up to what I have for you. Jesus died a death we could not die after living a life we couldn't live, but he didn't end on the cross. He rose again. And so today, as we worship God together, what he promises us is this. When you come back to the foot of the cross, he yet again offers you forgiveness. He yet again offers you a clean slate. He yet again offers you a second chance. Our worship resists idolatry because the world needs a called out people who know there is a better story than what they see painted on billboards, on TV screens, and in the idol factoring natures of our hearts.